question, please think about the other one. We have some time. Uh, this is one question. Hmm. What is supreme silence? Beautiful question. Silence is not an absence of something. For most of us who spend our lives in a constant state of stimuli overload, silence becomes the absence of that stimuli. I just need some quiet. What it means is I'm overloaded, I'm overstimulated. I just need the world to sort of stop. And that's what for most of us silence means. An absence of something. But silence is much more than that. Silence is not just the absence of stimuli, the absence of sound. Silence is actually very full. But it's full of something that's real and something that's deep within us. It allows us to hear what we're not able to hear because the rest of the auditory and visual stimuli is so overpowering. So silence is not empty. That's why a lot of us are afraid of silence. You'll notice, and luckily actually this is not such a, a disease in the Indian population. It's much more so in, in America, and I notice it a lot when I go back and forth. Indians can actually sit in a car with each other for up to hours at a time and feel absolutely no compulsion to speak. I love it. So you feel no compulsion to speak and you can sit for hours in silence. No one thinks it's weird. No one thinks it means that you don't love each other. No one thinks it means that you're a bad conversationalist. They're just sitting in silence. In the West, they don't have that. In the West, the moment there's about a 10 or 15 second lull in conversation, you start to see people racking their brains and you can literally almost watch it happen. People are trying to think of something, something I should say, because that silence is so uncomfortable. As though somehow I'm gonna fall into this bottomless pit of nothingness. But silence is not nothingness. Silence is very much something. It's just a different something than what we usually spend our lives listening to. So I would say, on an easy way to understand it, it's like a different frequency. On the radio or on a TV, you can only watch one channel at a time. You can't be tuned into, I mean, obviously now today they've got TVs where, for God's sakes, you've got four or five boxes going at a time, but the old TVs, you can only watch one channel at a time. And in many ways, that's, that's what our awareness and our focus is like. I can't simultaneously be tuned in and aware of and focused on and attentive to all of the sights and sounds and things going on in the world around me and simultaneously be tuned in to that inner divine voice. So in order to tune into that, I shut this off. But that's really what it is. It's really a, a turning of the antenna, if you would. Our, our, the antenna of the self, from facing outside to facing inside. Then what happens though, for many of us, is we turn the antenna inward, and then we find the same nonsense goes on inside. So now the outside world has shut up. Now we've locked ourselves up in a dark room. We've turned off the phones. We've turned off the TVs. Now our mind is doing the same thing. All of what we didn't want to hear people around us doing, all of the gossip, all of the criticism, all of the commentary, all of the worry, now we've got it going on in our own minds. So when we talk about supreme silence, we have to also quiet that. Otherwise, it's not really silent. It's just inner noise compared to outer noise. But it's not silence. That's where meditation comes in. And that's why first we quiet the outside world, but then we still have to quiet the inner world. So whether we use a mantra, whether we watch the breath, whether we listen to a chant, it doesn't matter. They're all vehicles, they're all tools 
to get us to a place where that inner noise can stop. And when that inner noise stops is when we're able to experience the fullness of what silence really is. There's a wonderful story of a, a seeker who is ready for enlightenment, or he thinks he's ready for enlightenment anyway, and he has done lots and lots of his own sadhana and lots and lots of study, and he asks everybody, who is the most enlightened guru? Where can I find him? I need enlightenment. So everybody directs him to this guru who sits on a hillside in a cave. He spends two weeks walking, he crosses rivers, he climbs the mountain, he gets to the top. The guru's sitting in meditation in the cave and he bows at the guru's feet and he says, Guruji, this is what I've studied, this is what I've learned, this is what I've done, and now, now, this is what I need. And the guru says, have a cup of tea. The man says, tea? I didn't come for tea. I came for enlightenment. I don't have time for tea. And the guru says, have a cup of tea. And he brings out a teapot and he gives the man a cup and he starts pouring and he pours and he pours and the cup is now full, but he keeps pouring. And now the tea is spilling out over the top of the cup and running around the ground. And the man yells, stop, what are you doing? The cup is full, it can't hold anymore. And the guru says, your mind is like this cup. You're so full of what you think you know, what you think you've done, what you think you need. I can't give you anything, there's no room. And that's how it is with silence. Silence isn't just an emptying of the cup. That's the first step. The supreme silence is when that cup gets refilled with that divine presence. But in order for it to be refilled, first we have to empty it. We can't simply add silence onto that which we already have. That's why we first have to create a quiet place, have a practice of meditation. These are just vehicles to empty that cup. And when the cup is empty, we all know nature doesn't like a vacuum. So when that cup is empty, that's when the divine presence comes in and that's when we have this, what you would call, supreme silence. One more. Two minutes to speak. Okay. Two minutes to answer. Okay. Longevity benefit of religion. Agree with, agree with what you say. Has there been a study that shows that religious people are healthy or live longer? There have been. There have been lots and lots of studies. It's really a sort of, at this point, A equals, if A equals B and if B equals C, then we know A also equals C. So for example, what we know is that religious people are happier people. That we know for sure. There's a direct correlation between religious and spiritual faith, actually. I won't go into too many details, I only have two minutes, but they've, they've actually dissected religious beliefs or religious practice into what they call intrinsic and what they call extrinsic. Extrinsic is, I come to temple, I perform puja, I do arti. Intrinsic is, I meditate, I pray, I do my japa, I feel that God is with me all the time. And while extrinsic religiousness absolutely also offers a lot of benefit, when you start to really narrow it down and peel off the layers, it's the intrinsic religiousness that offers the greatest benefit. So what we know is that people with intrinsic religiousness, with a deep internal sense of a connection to the divine, who practice that through prayer, through meditation, through inner worship, are happier people. And they measure that with all sorts of different tools and different techniques. Then we have our B equals C part, which is people who are happier live longer, which also we know. 
We absolutely know that good coping skills, life satisfaction, general happiness, absolutely provide a, a bolster effect for people when it comes to ailments, illnesses, and disease. So it's only a matter of time before they remove that inner peace and start to simply show that religion is also related to longevity. In the study that I mentioned about Duke, they've already shown that. If you're, if you're less likely to die, particularly if you're 25% less likely to die, then you live longer, of course. So yes, it has been shown, and I'm just waiting to see what they come up with as the reason for it. Because as I said, we're not handing out multivitamins. So it'll be, now that this has entered mainstream science, the religious people, of course, have answers. The Rishis have had answers. But now that this has entered the purview of mainstream science, what will mainstream science's reason be for the almost inoculatory effect that religion and spirituality have on our physical health? We'll have time. I think we're having a panel discussion after this anyway, right? So if there are more questions, we'll have time then. Yeah, we will take Thanks. more questions.